here at Emily Miller's book party with former NRA president David Keene. David, last time we saw you, you were NRA president. What is your new title I, with the Washington Times? It's, it's got to be very exciting for you. I'm the editorial and opinion editor of the Washington Times, which means I'm Emily's boss. <laughs> How proud are you of her uh, for what she does as a writer, first of all, and then to have put this book out? She's a fantastic writer. She, she takes sometimes complicated concepts and puts them in language that people can understand. Readers love her. Uh, she does a great job. And she has really emerged during the course of the last couple of years as probably the best, most thorough, and most knowledgeable journalist in terms of covering Second Amendment rights around the country. Uh, you know, David, you're an, you're an old hand at this town, back and forth. What is this, you know, you've watched uh, politicians, you've watched the media, and you've watched political media, of course. When you talk about newspapers and people are saying it's a dying media, it's a dinosaur media, what do you say back to that? What, what is the state of the newspaper industry, and what can you do to make it a little stronger? Well, the newspaper industry as an industry is in terrible shape. Uh, I appreciate your honesty. <laughs> papers are folding all over the country. We had a, uh, I was talking to our folks, and uh, we were able to report in July, and this is good news in the newspaper industry, that we had a, a smaller loss in July than we had in any month in recent uh, years. But in fact, uh, the Washington Times, which is, would not and could not survive simply as a print newspaper, is, is moving out onto other platforms. So uh, at the end of the month, we will have available an app where you can get the Times uh, on, on whatever communication device you've got. We're on radio. We're soon, uh, by October, we're going to be available in virtually every new Ford and Chevy that's bought because there'll be a, uh, there'll be a on-demand radio channel. Uh, we've got uh, our digital edition, as I say. We've got television on, uh, plan. In order to survive in today's world, uh, a news organization has to be able to occupy a number of platforms for advertising purposes and because we've got, a, we've got people who get their news in different ways. And uh, it, one of the reasons that I went to the Times after uh, retiring as NRA president is that the Times for decades has occupied an incredibly important position in Washington. Were it not for the Washington Times, this city would be very different than it is today because the Washington Post has been kept marginally honest by the existence of the Times. Well, David, I would also say nationwide, too, because it's such a respected conservative voice. Exactly the Washington right. Times is a very, na I would call it a national paper. Well, it is a national paper, and that's the other side of it. And because of that, we are confident that it will survive because the Washington Times is, in essence, the national conservative newspaper. Uh, that gives us a market that other papers don't have. It gives us a loyal readership as long as we deliver the goods for our readers uh, that's not going to abandon us. And so I'm confident that we're going we're to succeed. We're in the process of, of, in this modern world, reinventing the Times uh, and, uh, and giving, making it the conservative voice. And to be a part of that, is very exciting. You talked about the post. I got to ask you, new owner Jeff Bezos, famous, uh, he started Amazon. What do you expect uh, him to do to the newspaper? And h how do you expect to? Competition is always good. How do you expect that to make you a better paper? Well, it'll make us a better paper because competition is always good. But somebody I was talking to the other day said, "Why did he buy this?" And somebody else said, "Well, I think he bought it as a premium to give to Amazon uh, <laughs> customers." <laughs> we'll see what he's got in mind. Yeah. You know, it, it's funny because you think about the, um, the new paradigm and, and, and uh, iPads and iPhones, it, it almost seems as if it's uh, like a, well, a cell phone contract. Here, if you buy uh, the Washington Post, we're going to give you the, the free pad, exactly. and, and then you, you have to exactly. keep paying for the content. That's it, right. It's going to be interesting to see how it happens. Well, you know, one of the things, the Washington Times, as uh, most people here in Washington at least know, fell on some hard times. And it was precisely that that puts us in a position to be successful today because it's almost as if we're reinventing things and it's very hard to turn a uh, moderately successful publication around. Uh, the New York Times is discovering that. Every major newspaper is trying to reinvent itself, but it's hard. Uh, and we're actually way ahead of the curve. I talked to a, a good friend of mine last week who's one of the one of the really most respected newspaper editors in the country, and he said he thinks that the Washington Times is on the right track to survive. And he's not a conservative, but he said from a marketing standpoint, from the fact that we have a market niche and the fact that we're delivering what our readers want, which is conservative news and opinion, uh, and credibly, that he thinks we've got a better chance to survive as a print publication than all these others. When you put that together with a multi-platform approach, uh, I'm very optimistic.
All right, last question. I want to combine your two uh, knowledge bases, politics and newspapers. Uh, recently, the New York Times printed an op-ed from Vladimir Putin, and uh, we look at what's going on or what's not going on in, this, in the administration in terms of foreign policy. Talk about this mess in Syria and talk about how Russia has pretty much, uh, just what happened with Russia and what do you think of the Times printing this op-ed? Well, I can't blame the Times for printing it. I think, uh, I, think th I think we'd have rejected it because it was obviously just a propaganda piece by, from Vladimir Putin who was just can't resist sticking his finger in uh, Barack Obama's eye. And the real tragedy, I mean, there are th tragedies at various levels about our policies over there. They've obviously failed. This president has not provided the kind of leadership that he should provide, but think about this. Russia, which is struggling to reassert itself as a superpower, which it is not, uh, has been shut out of the Middle East for a long time. And because of the way in which the President of the United States has mishandled things, Russia is now the primary player in the Middle East, not only saving a client state, which Syria has always been, but setting up Vladimir Putin <laughs> as the peacemaker right. for the region. And Bizarro if, world. <laughs> if, if, uh, if anybody could do that, it was only Barack Obama. What do you think is going to be the end game here? What's going to happen if you had to do a, a Karnak? Well, Barack Obama is not going to get permission to bomb over there. He, had, he, he was not able to come up with a rationale that was in our national self-interest. And I was very pleased and ha am very pleased with the debate that's gone on. We've had a lot of debates over foreign policy and what we should do and what we shouldn't do. This debate was carried on in the right way. In other words, people were saying, when should the United States be willing to risk treasure and blood internationally? And uh, the answer is when our vital security interests are at stake. And the failure of the president was the failure to be able to link what, was, what he wanted to do in Syria with our vital national security interests. He had to admit they weren't a threat to us. They weren't a threat to our friends. Uh, they were involved in a civil war. And he wanted to get involved in it. And the American people are not stupid. And they've learned from history that that's not a good thing to do. And uh, that doesn't mean uh, contrary to the assertions of the president and the warnings, that doesn't mean that the American people aren't willing to fight for their interests, aren't willing to have a government that stands up, but the American people want to know why. And they want to know what the end game is and what you accept, expect to accomplish when you use American force. And I think that that's a very healthy debate and has come out just the way it should. David, thanks for your time. Good luck with the Times. We appreciate it. Thank you. My pleasure.